Thank you for uh, coming to the talk. I know it's late in the evening. I'm sure that most of you probably would rather go home and see your families and friends. But um, hopefully uh, uh, we'll have an entertaining session here. Um, I will say, can I dim the lights a little bit yeah. so that we can see this? Um, so just a quick uh, note on the backstory here. I was part of a roundtable session at the International Studies Association conference in, in March, March and April. And Eitan was there. And he said, Sean, when you're in Israel, how do you talk about what you said at the roundtable session? And I said, well, sure, that sounds great. Um, now that, of course, was you know remarks that I had written on a napkin um, the day before the roundtable session. So I've had I've had the opportunity to translate the napkin into a much more robust presentation here today. But this is um, really an ongoing research project of mine. I've, I've written, as Eitan noted, uh, quite a bit about I think the rise of Al Jazeera. And what, I, what I've witnessed in the last 12 months, 18 months, is what I think is the fall or the decline of Al Jazeera. Uh, but I'm, I'm very interested, of course, in your feedback and questions and thoughts. And so uh, please do raise your hand if, if there are any questions at all or if I could clarify anything, OK? OK. OK. <laughs> um, as Eitan mentioned, the, the data for this presentation is based on I've been to Doha six times now, uh, usually for about a week at a time. And I've interviewed 75 or 80 employees of Al Jazeera, English, Arabic, sport, children. Um, and I stay in close touch with a, a couple of them, a, num a number of them. And then, of course, I've also been in Tunisia, I've been in Egypt, I've been le in Lebanon, uh, Turkey, and, and now Israel in the past 12 months. And so it's also based on some field work there. Um, what, I'm gonna, what, I, what I'd like to do is, is split Al Jazeera's history into two eras, so to speak. And the first one is what you see, there it's on my on your left. This is the Al Jazeera era from 1996 until 2008. And then the second epic is from 2008 until 2012, which is what I describe as the fall of Al Jazeera. The Al Jazeera era was uh, a, a term coined by Mark Lynch, who studied uh, kind of the introduction of Al Jazeera into the Arab world and its, its strength and significance for the first 10 years of its existence until 2006. And I just want to highlight a few things about its history that help explain why the decline is, is starting, in, my, in my, my research, in my opinion. So, of course, as, as many of you know, I mean, you all know a little bit about Al Jazeera, yeah? It started in 1996. It's funded by the Emir of Qatar. Um, it's uh, obviously quite popular and powerful in the Middle East. The, the thing I wanted to touch on here, of course, is that uh, why Al Jazeera was launched in the first place. And so there's, there are kind of three important facts that we need to at least uh, recognize. The first one is, in 1995, the current Emir of Qatar, uh, in a bloodless coup, took power from his father. Yeah, that's, that's usually how transitions go in, in Qatar. And as a result of that, he had to find a way to establish legitimacy both in the Arab world and in the Western world. And so uh, Al Jazeera was uh, a means to establish legitimacy with both those, those audiences. And let me explain. In the Arab world, Al Jazeera gave him a microphone to, to push back against uh, Saudi Arabian, Egyptian, and to a lesser extent, Iranian criticisms of his steal of power, of his, of his coup d'etat. It gave him the ability to distract public opinion in the Arab world away from the fact that he had taken power and towards other issues like corruption or taboo subjects that had previously not been talked about in the mainstream media. That worked quite effectively, as it turned out. In the West, what Al Jazeera uh, did is it gave the Emir the credibility to say, President Clinton, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, other Western democracies, I'm going to put Qatar on a path towards democracy. And the first step, or one of the first steps, will be we're going to introduce a free and independent media organization that will break all the taboos that you've been critical of for the last 40 years. So it was, is, and this is something that uh, Eitan and I have written quite a bit about, it was a, a strategic move to launch Al Jazeera. It was not a benevolent move. It was not because the emir loves freedom of expression or just thinks debate is really something that is uh, intrinsically nice, though he may think those things, strategically it was, it was, in the, uh, it was advantageous for Qatar. Um, at the same time, of course, it, it just happened to be the case that BBC Arabic was collapsing because of a, a lack of uh, Saudi Arabian cooperation with the initiative. And so then there were about 120 or 130 BBC trained journalists that were you know, natural Arabic speakers looking for employment, which made the, the launching of Al Jazeera quite, quite simple, really. I'm going to jump forward to 2003. 
Um, between 1996 and 2003, we see Al Jazeera become the most popular, watched, most powerful uh, news organization in the region. Um, in 1998 was a really important year for Al Jazeera. They, they covered Operation Desert Fox, which was uh, uh, a military operation uh, coordinated by the United States and the UK in, in the northern part of Iraq. And they were able to capture tremendous civilian casualty and destruction that really characterized the American military effort in a negative way. And that coverage spilled over into a, a narrative that they utilized in their coverage of Israeli and Palestinian politics thereafter that was quite popular and helped them skyrocket to tremendous popularity in the region. Um, 2003, I identified here as an important part of Al Jazeera's history because in 2003, we're after 9-11 and we're after the period where Al Jazeera is uh, uh, broadcasting tapes of Osama bin Laden, which of course upset the American government quite a bit. And the Emir of Qatar, uh, Amir Althani and his wife traveled to the United States in December of 2003, uh, hoping for a warm reception, like you, like you would if you were the head of an important country in the Middle East. And about a week before the, the trip, they were actually told they were not going to be able to meet with either President Bush or Laura Bush. And the reason they were given was that Al Jazeera was causing just too much trouble. The coverage of, of Iraq in particular was so anti-American that the Bush administration did not want to see uh, the Emir and his wife and certainly did not want to be hosting them, uh, given the difficulty that the Americans were having with Al Jazeera's coverage. The Emir was furious. It was embarrassing to have to cancel the trip. It was embarrassing that he couldn't see the president, who, of course, was a close ally militarily. As many of you know, the main American military facility that was used for the invasion of Iraq is based in, in Doha, just about 12 miles away from Al Jazeera. And the Emir came back from that trip or, or canceled the trip and said, we need to do something to improve our image in the West. We're going to launch Al Jazeera English. And this will be our effort to, to utilize this great resource we have in, in Al Jazeera, but it'll be in English and it will cater to English speaking audiences because they need to get this news, but they can't think uh, of the Arabic station whenever they think of Al Jazeera. The reason why I go into some depth here is, again, you see the launching of Al Jazeera, English was geopolitically motivated just like the launching of Al Jazeera Arabic was geopolitically motivated in 1996. At this time, too, you begin to see, you can't see this, can you? No, no it's OK. It, it, they're, they're boring quotes, really. Um, at this time, but by 2003, Al Jazeera is the top news organization in, in the Middle East. And what I have here are a series of experts that are, are basically noting its significance and its ability to change public opinion in the region. Um, some people say it's, it's the most powerful non-state actor in, in the Arab world. Uh, some people say among all the major influences of, of Arab public opinion, the mosque, the press, the schools, the newest and perhaps most revolutionary is Al Jazeera. No big deal. You guys, you, you know this to be true. So we, it's all right if, if we don't have all the quotes. So that's 2003. Let's jump to 2006. And again, I'm, I'm kind of running through the history to focus on what I think is more interesting now, which is the decline. But there are parts of the history that are important to tell the story. In 2006, Al Jazeera English is finally launched. Right? So remember, I said late 2003, the decision is made to launch Al Jazeera English. It's not launched until three years later in 2006. And this is a global operation, independently operated from Al Jazeera Arabic. Whole different set of journalists, whole different uh, set of editorial decision makers. Um, also in 2006, we see the decision to turn all of Al Jazeera's assets into a big network. And what I mean by that is, rather than have independent channels like Al Jazeera English, Al Jazeera Arabic, Al Jazeera Mubasher, which is their documentary channel, um, they decided to put them under an umbrella called the Al Jazeera Network, who would then have control over all the stations. This was an effort to organize the brand of Al Jazeera given the proliferation of media assets that, that we were seeing. And an important decision was made in 2006, and that was to appoint Wadah Confer, a uh, Jordanian-Palestinian, to the head of the overall network. Wadah was um, originally an Al Jazeera correspondent in India, and then in South Africa, and then in Afghanistan, and then in Iraq, and then the bureau chief in Iraq. And in 2003, he was asked to actually take over for managing the whole Arabic organization and is credited to a large extent with its uh, success and significance in covering the Iraq war. Hugely popular 
uh, a journalist among, among the Al Jazeera staff for uh, the most part. Obviously, there's um, outliers. But the important thing is, while they're launching this global English language channel of Al Jazeera English, they decide to put Wada in charge of it. So there is, and not only an Arab in charge, but also uh, an Arab of Palestinian roots with uh, open sympathies towards the Muslim Brotherhood is in, placed in charge of Al Jazeera English. So far, so good? Okay. 2008. And I think this is really an important uh, time where you begin to see actions that precipitate the decline of the network. And so 2008, we begin to see a much more aggressive Qatari foreign policy. As I'm sure you all remember much, much more than most Americans do, the, uh, the Emir was critical to negotiating uh, peace in Lebanon in late 2007. You begin to see a, an independent foreign policy articulated by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, more speeches at the United Nations, more speeches in international media, more trips to the United States, the UK and Paris, articulating a Qatari vision for the future of, of international relations, one that actually mirrors a Kantian idea of perpetual peace. It's very idealistic. We can all get along if we just trade enough goods back and forth. The, the details of the foreign policy aren't really too important at this point in time, but what is important is you begin to see Qatari foreign policy being articulated as independent from Saudi foreign policy, as independent from Gulf foreign policy, and of course as independent from the rest of the Arab world's foreign policies. And the reason why this is important is Al Jazeera was successful in the Middle East because audiences weren't suspicious to a certain extent, they were not suspicious of the fact that it was funded by the Qatari government. The typical response you would get before 2008 was, well, of course the Emir pays for Al Jazeera, but who cares? It's just Qatar. What are they going to do? It's a small country. Uh, they don't wield any significance. They don't have a, a big agenda that really we're opposed to. In 2008, you begin to see a shift, a specific agenda emerging from the Qatari government. And then, as a result, people more uh, cautious about accepting media that's produced by a government that's asserting itself more aggressively in, in foreign policy circles. One more thing happened in 2008 that's important to know, and that is Qatar and Saudi Arabia finally came to reconciliation. And so when Al Jazeera was launched in 1996, up until 2007, it was fiercely critical of Saudi Arabia and, of course, the king uh, of Saudi Arabia. Uh, and, and really, I mean, I think it openly, would openly describe itself at times as uh, propaganda against Saudi Arabia. And this has to do with the historical relationship between the two countries. Um, in 2008, that, dis that dispute was resolved. The Emir and Wada went to Jeddah and met with the king, and they came to an agreement on a number of issues, one of which was that Al Jazeera would no longer uh, target Saudi Arabia as critically as it had been and it would focus on other parts of the region. Um, folks at the organization noted the change immediately after the meeting, that the stories that they had pitched the week before about Saudi Arabia were no longer being discussed in the editorial meetings. And so uh, this, is, this is an important moment because the mainstream press in the West even picked up on the fact that there was an editorial change out in Al Jazeera that directly followed a foreign policy meeting by the head of state. And it was one of the first very compelling indications that the Qatari government did indeed have editorial power over what Al Jazeera was broadcasting. Again, I've got some really boring quotes here, uh, and so it's good that you can't see them. Uh, but there's one I want to read to you. Actually, we can't see that. Okay. Professor Gilboa can see it because he's, he's 10 feet from them. Uh, <laughs> um, the one I, I, I do want to point your attention to actually is this bottom one from Ibrahim Halal, who's an interesting person. Ibrahim has been with the organization since it launched, and he's been on the Arabic side, on the English side, he helped oversee the launch of Al Jazeera Balkans. Uh, he helped oversee the potential launch of Al Jazeera Turk. He literally has, has put many different hats on in the organization. He knows it well, and he's a close friend of the emirs. In an interview uh, about 12 months ago, Ibrahim said to me, he said, Al Jazeera is like the nuclear option. Its track record of causing trouble for Arab governments and its record of mobilizing the Arab masses gives Qatar a weapon in its foreign relations. Like a nuclear weapon, the simple threat of its use is often enough to give Qatar an upper hand 
in political negotiations. The reason why I wanted to uh, read this out loud to you, I mean, even though it's a boring quote, is to give you a sense of just how well understood the relationship between Al Jazeera's significance and Qatari foreign policy was in the newsroom. Now, Ibrahim was not telling me that Al Jazeera is used by the Qatari government, but the fact that he's equating it with the nuclear option indicates his cognizance of its impact on the international politics of the Qatari government, which is an indicator that there's something else going on. So now I'm going to talk about, I think, what you all came here to actually hear, which is the fall of Al Jazeera. <laughs> Sound good? Okay. 2010. As, as you all remember quite well, uh, 2009, December 2009, and, and then January 2010 was the Gaza War. And this was an important moment for Al Jazeera. They, they had, of course, they had their uh, news crews in Gaza, but they also had a, a, an English-speaking news crew in Gaza. They had both Arabic and English, and they were the only international news organization with a full English-speaking news crew in Gaza. And this was um, a triumphant moment for them to capture the footage of the war, uh, as Professor Goboa's chapter in Al Jazeera English indicates, um, tremendous amounts of bias was, was offered by both the English and the Arabic channel in this case. And, and Al Jazeera English thought that this was going to be a triumphant moment, that this would be uh, a way to show the West that Al Jazeera English was going to give them something they couldn't see from other news organizations. And that was somewhat true. There was actually increased interest in Al Jazeera English among journalists and among professors, intellectuals, liberals, people that were looking for reasons to be critical of Israel, flocked to Al Jazeera English to capture the images uh, of the Gaza War. But that wasn't enough. It wasn't actually breaking through to other mainstream news organizations. NBC, CBS, ABC were not broadcasting the images that Al Jazeera was capturing. And this frustrated Al Jazeera to no end. And so they kept on pushing it, they kept on pushing it, until finally, they decided that enough was enough, and they, they uh, launched an initiative called the Creative Commons Initiative. Did you all hear about this? So they teamed up with Creative Commons, which is a nonprofit organization based in San Francisco that helps you copyright your creative uh, works of art or creative uh, news stories in a way that does not require you to sell them. Basically, it allows you to give them away for free while still retaining the ownership of those clips. And what Al Jazeera did is it along with Creative Commons, posted every single minute of news that it had, it had uh, captured from Gaza from December 1st until January 31st, and issued it to the public on the internet for free. Now, this is unprecedented. A news organization in the middle of the, the, the greatest uh, business crisis the news industry has seen in, in, in decades, saying we're going to give away exclusive footage of, the, of Gaza war for free. Anyone who wants it, and you can, NBC can rebroadcast it, CNN can rebroadcast it, they don't have to pay us anything. It was an amazing attempt to get the message out. Now, they, of course, said this is the, the future of news. This is how um, news organizations should be thinking about information. But what came out of this, actually, was an interesting perspective that Al Jazeera English only issued, or Al Jazeera as a network, only issued Gaza-related footage under Creative Commons. They didn't issue anything else that they have, have had been uh, uh, following, any other stories, any other uh, images from any other story around the world, except for those related to the Gaza war. And what happened, what, what, what came out of this, was an indication in, in Western news organizations that Al Jazeera was trying to push the Palestinian issue at the expense of other issues. That if they really felt strongly about getting rid of copyright, that they would put all of their material up or at least a fair amount of it up equally under this Creative Commons license and not just the Gaza coverage. And so you, you see an innovative move uh, on behalf of Al Jazeera, one that focuses on new media technologies and kind of innovative business models for news, and you see it backfire from a public relations perspective. You also see a few other things going on in 2010. One is the, the tension between Al Jazeera English and Al Jazeera Arabic gets incredibly intense. So from the beginning of the launch of Al Jazeera English, Al Jazeera Arabic felt that, and this is, um, I'm speaking broadly, but I think accurately, Al Jazeera Arabic journalists felt that the English side got too much money, the journalists were paid too much, that they were offered contracts that uh, an Arab-speaking uh, journalist would not get, that they would pay for uh, an English-speaking journalist's uh, uh, kids to come to Doha, they'd pay for the private school, 
uh, all sorts of perks that the Arabic side is not receiving, including a, a beautiful new building. So while Al Jazeera Arabic was still working out of this relatively small and run-down uh, complex, Al Jazeera English had a state-of-the-art building, kind of like the one I'm, I'm speaking in right now, this nice <laughs> building right here. And that tension came to a head in 2010 because Al Jazeera English and Al Jazeera Arabic covered the Gaza war in, in different ways. Al Jazeera English tried to be what we would call more objective. I don't think you could get objective news, but they tried to be more balanced, whereas Al Jazeera Arabic was an advocacy organization for Hamas throughout the conflict. And so in, in March, March of 2010, at, in Doha, there was a conference where we had the head of, of Al Jazeera Arabic, we had the head of Al Jazeera English talking about their coverage of the Gaza war. And someone raised their hand and said, nice, nice work to you both, but why is it the case that your two news channels with the same resources and the same journalists covered the same war in such very different ways? And there was silence. Both, both of them looked at each other, and Wada said, I don't think we covered the conflict in a different way. I think we covered it in the same way. And the head of Al Jazeera English, Tony Berman, looked at Wada and laughed and said, I'm sorry, I just can't, I can't go along with that. And said, he, he defended Al Jazeera English's coverage as responsible. Tony's a, a Canadian Broadcasting Corporation vet of 30 years. He used to run uh, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, I think a terrific journalist and, and an honest person. And he just said, I can't, I can't agree with it. And then he defended Al Jazeera English's approach, and then he criticized Al Jazeera Arabic's coverage of the war. And this was this moment was important. So you see, the heads of the two news organizations that are supposed to be collaborating and cooperating really disagreeing, and and the English side really being critical of the Arabic side, on top of mounting tensions between the two, the two organizations. Anyone know what happens as a result of this of this fight? An on stage fight in front of me. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> Tony is fired. Tony Berman is fired. I mean, it's a it's standard way. So he's moved to the Washington, D.C. office as a consultant. Three months later, he's no longer with the organization. Uh, can't find his email address anywhere. And so uh, Tony was, was removed, and he was replaced with Al Ansi, uh, a much less significant uh, person who now runs the Al Jazeera English organization. The reason why I tell the story and the anecdote in some depth is because the brand of Al Jazeera, the network of Al Jazeera, depends on cohesion and coherence between its different programs and its different channels. You can't have your different media assets telling the same story in very different ways and disagreeing in public about the ethics of how they cover that conflict. And the microcosm of that conflict that I witnessed and I just told you about was exploding in the newsroom. The tension about how you cover Middle East politics was gigantic and there was not a way to agree between the two. And as a result, you begin to see Al Jazeera English thinking of itself as distinct from Al Jazeera Arabic, and Al Jazeera Arabic thinking of itself as distinct from Al Jazeera English. The problem is they have the same name, the same brand, and the same person funds them both. And so from a branding perspective, if we've got any public relations uh, majors or professors in the room, that's not a, a scenario you want to be in charge of. That is a scenario for disaster. A lot, one more thing I'll, I'll add, or two more things I'll add here. Uh, it becomes increasingly apparent that Al Jazeera Arabic, under the leadership of Confer, is pursuing an uh, Islamist agenda, promoting the agendas of the Muslim Brotherhood, perhaps even a Nada, the Islamist party that recently won the, the post revolution elections in Tunisia, uh, and of course the AK party in, um, in Turkey. And, and he's clashing, of course, with the more secular traditional news agenda, which at least a, a number of the original BBC Arabic journalists that came over to Al Jazeera in 1996 were pursuing. And what you saw is you saw that the secular agenda journalists were increasingly dispatched to positions outside of Doha. They were, they were told to go to set up a new bureau in Ghana or uh, a new bureau in um, South Korea, where they would not have as much influence over the day-to-day -day operations of, of Al Jazeera Arabic. You also saw a lot of tension coming out of old media and new media uh, journalists. And so one of CONFAR's uh, initiatives was to hire a, a number, a large number of very smart and sophisticated, mostly men, young men, um, that launched Al Jazeera's new media projects. Creative Commons being one of them, uh, mobile devices being another one, 
they, they wanted to train their journalists how to use new technologies, emerging technologies, to report on issues quicker and with more depth. They also wanted to use those new technologies to get cameras and microphones in the hands of citizens, really embracing citizen journalism in a new way. And this was an exciting time, of course, for that to happen. At the same time, though, you've got traditional journalists that had been working in the industry for 20 years, 30 years, used to uh, a particular way of covering a story, saying, let's hold up a second. We don't want to be broadcasting YouTube videos from Damascus, for example. We don't know who took that video. We don't know if the information about that video is accurate. And under, under CONFAR, the new media team won. He really had a lot of uh, interest and, and intrigue in the possibility of new media. And you began to see Al Jazeera embracing new media technologies well ahead of other news organizations. And I would say early on it was a strength of the organization. Later on, in Syria, it becomes uh, a weakness. 2011, of course, is a very important year. What we see in 2011 First and foremost is the Arab uprising starting in Tunisia, going on to Egypt, going on to Libya, going on to Syria, uh, with possible revolutions taking place in Bahrain and eastern Saudi Arabia, possibly Yemen, all around the Middle East. But what started out as a great success for Al Jazeera turned out to be really uh, its greatest weakness. And so Al Jazeera had one contact in Tunisia in January of 2011, a former reporter who had turned into a human rights activist who was friends with a number of journalists at the organization. Um, and what, uh, his name is Lufti Haji. You heard of Lufti Haji? So Lufti was an activist and Lufti captured um, the self-immolation in Benghazi on tape and got a copy of that. Uh, of course, this is the, the video that sparked the revolution that sparked the rest of the revolutions. It's the most important part of the uh, Arab uprisings that we need to know about. And Lufti got a hold of this video. I, I spoke incorrectly. He didn't tape it himself. He got a hold of it from Facebook, and he forwarded it to some friends at Al Jazeera, and they said, this is good. We've got to broadcast this. And Lufti said, I got it from Facebook. I don't know. I can't bear I wasn't there. And Al Jazeera said, it's OK. Let's broadcast it, and I want you to go, Lufti, I want you to go to your friends. Let's get some more footage of what's going on in Tunisia. And what happened there between this one human rights activist, Al Jazeera, and its tens of millions of viewers was protests broadcast live via Tunisia or almost in real time, encouraging more people to go out and protest. It's called the demonstration effect. When you see people protesting successfully, not getting beaten up by police, being successful in their efforts to, to make public their calls for change, people that are disenfranchised come out in larger and larger crowds. And Al Jazeera was focused on making sure these images got to the public quickly and, and were very powerful images, grainy footage from cell phones that they found using social media. This was the beginning of the Arab uprisings. Of course, we know how it goes. We know it, it ben, uh, ben Ali has to leave uh, Tunisia just a few weeks later. We, we see it then jumped to Egypt, where Al Jazeera was hesitant at first to cover it until they realized just how significant the protests were. And then for 17 or 18 days, nothing else was broadcast on Al Jazeera except for uh, images of protesters protesting successfully against Mubarak. So from there, they then take their operation after Mubarak uh, uh, leaves power, and they go to Libya and really push for the removal of Gaddafi, Colonel Gaddafi, from power. Uh, and succeed, though that took quite a bit longer. Um, what happened in, in Libya is really interesting, of course, because to tie this back to the emergence of an independent Qatari foreign policy, you begin to see Qatar playing a very important role in the Libyan conflict. So the military base I, I, I mentioned to you earlier, uh, just 12 miles uh, away from the Al Jazeera Broadcasting Center, was the primary base that the no-fly zone used to enforce the no-fly zone over Libya. Um, Qatari uh, fighters were actually used to train Libyan rebels in how to, to defeat Gaddafi. And weapons funneled from France went through Qatar to get to Libya. So the Qatari foreign policy was explicitly against Gaddafi, which was, of course, interesting in its own right. It was joined with a substantial propaganda effort on behalf of Al Jazeera Arabic and, to a lesser extent, Al Jazeera English on the success of the rebels 
and decrediting Gaddafi and his allied fighters. Of course, that was successful in the end from the eyes of the Qatari perspective, and they move on to Syria, which is ongoing. And I'm sure you all have read the criticisms of Al Jazeera's coverage of Syria. It's become quite public now that uh, they're only telling one side of the story, and that is one that is very critical of Assad. It does not paint a complete picture of how the conflict came to be and who the actors are. And a number of high-level Al Jazeera journalists have complained and have resigned over the fact that the coverage is so biased and unbalanced. On top of this, you see Al Jazeera not covering, in nearly as much depth, protests that are close to causing a revolution in Bahrain, or at least have as much potential to cause a revolution as the protests in Tunisia did when they started. And you, you even see people calling out Al Jazeera for its lack of coverage. And as a result of that, Al Jazeera starts getting more uh, Qatari foreign policy establishment people to talk about why they're not intervening. And so now you're actually beginning to see the transition towards a more formal, traditional propaganda outlet. The government's using its media broadcaster to actually express its opinion as to why it's not intervening. Now, of course, if I was a Qatari policymaker, I would have done the same thing. Well, maybe not the same thing. But I understand why they didn't want to uh, foster a revolution in Bahrain. That's terrible for, for Qatari foreign policy. The problem is it was so obviously connected to the geopolitics of the government, Al Jazeera's credibility was significantly weakened. Its journalists felt like they weren't doing the job that they had come to Al Jazeera to do. And internal morale really fell quite quickly. Audiences also decided that they had had enough of Al Jazeera's one-sided coverage. I want to talk about this poll first. This is a, a poll that was, it was done by um, Nielsen uh, in just, just after the Egyptian revolution, asking people what satellite or what television news station they were getting the news from during the removal of Mubarak, the, the protests, and of course afterwards. And there are three questions. The first one you can't see. I will read it to you. It says, of the following radio and TV stations, which, if any, are you currently using to stay informed about the protests and related developments? Second question, of the stations you have mentioned, which are you using most for information about the protests and related developments in Egypt? And third, in your opinion, which have had the most reliable reporting on these events? Now, of course, Al Jazeera historically has pulled quite well in Egypt and across the region. And this is really fascinating. Al Arabiya came in first by a long shot. 65% of respondents said they were currently using Al Arabiya. 42% uh, said it was the most reliable source of news for protests and developments in Egypt. That was a really important finding. Even more interesting, though, is how far down Al Jazeera fell. Was this done by phone? It was done by AC Nielsen by phone, yes. It's, look, all audience, re all audience research in the, in the Arab world is tough. Those who use phone in Egypt are those who would uh, relate to the government. Because those who do not use phone, don't have any phones, are these who live in unplanned neighborhoods with no running water, with no electricity, no phone, no nothing. And they are as far as could be from Al-Arabiya. Just do they, do they watch television? Yeah, they are right. Sure, and they are the last to watch around. Okay. Well, then I think that just proves your argument, sir. We'll, 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 yeah. Um, I, I, will, I will say this is a limited survey. It was it was relatively small. It was the only one that was done at the time, um, and all all audience research in this region it has some weaknesses. And so, um, but but it's still important. It's still important and interesting. You see Al Jazeera's credibility going down quite a bit. Of course, twenty two percent saying they're currently using. And only 4% saying it's the most reliable. What about um, Al Jazeera English at that time? Well, because this was of Egyptians, specifically of Egyptians, uh, they didn't ask about Al Jazeera English because Egyptians are probably going to tune into the Arabic yeah. station. I'm not even sure if you have to be online to get it. Um, there were similar studies done of Americans who were watching Al Jazeera English, and, and Americans consumed Al Jazeera English 450%. Uh, there's a 450% increase in the audience of Al Jazeera English in the United States during the month of January and February. It was tremendous. And the question, of course, is did that spill over? Um, but this is an imperfect, though I think significant poll. Um, this one is, is a bit more robust. This is the annual uh, Shibli Telhami poll. The uh, professor at the University of Maryland 
teams up with Pew Research and does an annual uh, uh, opinion poll in, in the Middle East of uh, usually 6,000 or 6,500 Arabs from a variety of countries. And if you're curious, I can tell you which countries. Um, but I just wanted to highlight this one slide, which asks, when, when you watch international news, which of the following networks news broadcast do you watch most often? This was conducted in June 2011. So this is before the majority of the Syria controversy has even taken place. And you see Al Jazeera, of course, much more substantially uh, significant than Al Arabiya, NBC, or LBC. But what I'm interested here in is the trend. Is the trend you see, 2009, 58% of respondents said Al Jazeera was number one, then 38%, and then 43%. Now, you could look at this and say, these people are insignificant, and I would agree with you. But I'm more interested in a 15-point decline in Al Jazeera's audiences uh, over the course of two years. That's a significant decline in audiences, and the question, of course, is why? It could be the internet. It could be something else. In 2011, later on, there were in important things that happened. Most of you, I'm sure, heard of WikiLeaks. Mm -hmm. Most of you, as I'm sure, have heard of the specific cables that came out of WikiLeaks that provided evidence of cooperation between uh, CONFAR and the Department of Defense on changing content on Al Jazeera's website. The cable was explicit. It was, um, in some ways, um, not, in, in my opinion, it was not controversial. But the way the news covered it made it seem as though the US government was able to manipulate coverage on Al Jazeera through a simple phone call from an embassy. Are you all familiar with this? No? OK. So um, the cable uh, documented uh, a couple of conversations between defense intelligence analysts. D it's called DIA, part of the DOD, and CONFAR about images, bloody images of American soldiers and gruesome images of civilian casualties in Iraq, where CONFAR agreed with the DOD analysis that they should not be on the website and then took them down. And then other cables indicated an ongoing conversation between the State Department and CONFAR about if their coverage was living up to the expectations of the American government. The cables were uh, covered quite well in the West and were especially controversial in the Middle East. Uh, the day the cables were released publicly, uh, the day afterwards, CONFAR resigned from the position. He had been in charge of the networks for eight years, uh, its most beloved managing director in its history. And he resigned as, as a result of the cables, according to some. I don't think that's why he resigned. But Al Jazeera's credibility was tarnished in a lot of ways as a result of what people thought was evidence of collusion between the American government and the Al Jazeera editorial team. The more important part of the story actually is not WikiLeaks or the, the resignation of Wadah Confer. The more important part of the story is who replaced Wadah, a cousin of the Emir, an Althani family member took over for Wadah. This is uh, really important because if you go back to the history that I, I, I told you about, the critical aspect of Al Jazeera was it was independent of the government. That was the reason why it was uh, appeasing of the Clinton administration because it would be an independent news organization in the Middle East that could cover things in its own way. Why then would you appoint a member of the royal family to oversee the whole operation? No one really knows the answer. I've got my opinions. But to this day, as a result of the resignation of Confar, which many think was forced, uh, Al Thani's cousin, a former executive at Qatar Gas, is now running the Al Jazeera network. What do we know about this Al Thani? Do you know anything about him? He belongs to the royal family or something? Part of the royal family, uh, relatively young, relatively weak in the royal family, which is to say he's not a vocal um, opinion maker. Not a lot of public speeches from, from Al Thani. Um, importantly, of course, he has the royal family, family's interest in mind. He successfully turned around Qatar Gas from a relatively weak corporation to an a extremely profitable corporation. And my speculation is he was brought in to try to make Al Jazeera a functional business for the first time. So it wasn't sucking government resources on an annual basis, but rather self-sustainable. And so he was there to cut out the fat, get rid of people that didn't belong there, uh, create a more corporate business model for how things would be conducted, uh, and of course, protect the Qatari interests and not allow Al Jazeera to become an advocate of revolutions 
that could actually destabilize the Middle East well beyond what Qatar had expected when they encouraged the, the revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt. So, journalists at Al Jazeera, the day after Al Thani came to power, said they could feel the difference in the newsroom. They, they talked about how there was fear, because there was no compelling explanation as to why Wada had, had resigned. There was fear that anything they did could result in their quote unquote resignation. No one understood where the red lines were anymore. And as a result, self censorship kicks in. You become very afraid to tell stories you think are interesting. If they get potentially upset, the royal family, who of course a member of, is now your new boss. And, and folks who watch Al Jazeera, I watch Al Jazeera, and you could see the tone of the coverage change very quickly. And you could also see the anti Syria coverage increase under Al Thani's reign. This resulted in the resignation of, of several journalists as a result, and it continues to this day to confuse journalists working for the network. 2012. Today. The revved up coverage of Syria, especially relying on unconfirmed social media sources, has discredited Al Jazeera's coverage of everything about Syria. It's, it's, it's really um, almost embarrassing for someone who's studied the, the network for as long as I have and, and found it to be compelling at times to see how biased his coverage of Syria is. It, it's almost like um, they're treating Assad like Assad's Israel, to give you a sense for just how extreme the bias is, in, in my opinion. At the same time, Al Thani's reign still remains unclear for journalists. They don't understand why a non-journalist is running the organization. They don't understand why an organization that was supposed to be independent of the government they, you know, they signed contracts with this organization, which is supposed to be free and independent, and all of a sudden it's now run by a member of the government. They don't know what that means. They don't know what that means for their job. They do know that the coverage seems to be guided by politics more than it had in the past, state politics. And they do know that if they step too far over a red line, they will be asked to leave Doha quite, quite quickly. And so the culture that at, at, in the Al Jazeera newsroom is really one that's stifling and, and not as exciting as it used to be. More importantly than, than this, though, I would say, I've got some good images of um, some Syrian uh, posters that are, are now starting a movement against Al Jazeera. It's called Stop Al Jazeera, which I, I, I don't know if these are significant. I, I have no idea. But they're, they're compelling images, so I thought I'd share them with you. More important than, than all of this, I mean, I, I don't think anything I've said means Al Jazeera is, uh, is necessarily on the decline. What I do think it means is that Al Jazeera is unprepared for the onslaught of competition that it faces in the next two years. And so, as a result of the revolutions that it helped foster, you begin to see the emergence of a tremendous amount of diverse and persuasive local media in Tunisia and Egypt in particular, Libya to a lesser extent, but certainly to an extent. And that's competition they have not had to face in the past. In addition to the local news that's emerging in key markets, B Sky B is launching an Arabic language channel this month. Bloomberg is launching an Arabic language channel next month. The Muslim Brotherhood is launching Egypt 25 in December. Um, BBC Arabic is increasingly uh, watched by Arab viewers, viewers. Its audience has tripled in the last six months, according to BBC uh, audience surveys. The competition in the region is dramatically changing. And Al Jazeera, the strongest news organization for a long time, is at a point where the people that work for the organization don't know where it's going. They don't know why they're being led by a member of the royal family. And they're not excited about the fact that they're propagating a story about Syria that most of them don't believe to be true. They're also still upset about the fact that they couldn't cover Bahrain in the same way that they covered the Tunisian protests and the Egyptian protests. And you put these together. You've got an organization that's, that's falling apart at the seams, facing robust competition from a number of new competitors, both, at, both from the perspective of Businesses that know how to successfully compete. Bloomberg is one of the fiercest competitors in the world. 
B Sky B, of course, is uh, a collaboration with the one and the only Rupert Murdoch, another one of the world's fiercest business competitors. And they're also facing competition from local channels. And I keep on emphasizing this because in the States and in Europe, local news is where people are actually finding successful business models. People, doesn't matter what happens in the world, they still want to know what's going on around them. And so Al Jazeera's model of news, one that's focused on pan-Arab issues, may not work in a world where local news is offered by its competitors in the majority of the countries it used to rely on for its audience. And that is the reason I think we are witnessing the decline of Al Jazeera. Now, if you'll allow me, Eitan would not let me give a talk without connecting it to some academic theory. <laughs> he would be tremendously disappointed if I, didn't, if I didn't touch on theories. And so let me tell you what I think the, the relevance and the consequence of, of this story is to some theories that I am interested in, and hopefully you're interested in one or two of them. Um, I'll start with political economy, because I think the story of Al Jazeera uh, makes a compelling argument as to why media analysis needs to focus on political economy a lot more than framing of the news. So we've seen in the last 10 years a tremendous amount of framing studies on Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, BBC, Al Hura, CNN, you name it, we can find it. These are very interesting and they're good, good research and they're well done, but they don't tell the whole story. Political economy methods and theory help the framing analysis Tell the whole story. Why is it the case that someone is framing a conflict this way or that way? The story of Al Jazeera's rise and decline, in my opinion, is best told not through a framing analysis, so that would be a helpful way to complement the story. It is really a question of political economy. What are the motivations, the political and economic motivations and constraints for Al Jazeera that determine its success or failure? Second, propaganda theory. Unpopular, I don't care. I still think it's relevant and want to make sure we, we keep it on the books. Propaganda theory, of course, was developed in a robust way in the 20th century, but then after uh, the Second World War, for very obvious reasons, propaganda became a dirty word, and, and the academic study of propaganda decreased. But I, I still think it's relevant. One of the most important lessons about propaganda theory is that successful propaganda has to be truthful. It has to be truthful. That lies cannot be compelling propaganda over the long term, because people will find out their lies, and then the institution is discredited. The story of Al Jazeera's decline indicates that is precisely the case. It's, it's broadcasting of stories from Syria that turned out to be lies. They were citizen videos they had accessed via social media that turned out to be planted there by, by political actors, a number of political actors, have severely discredited its credibility on any question related to Syria, and I think hurt its overall brand. And I think this demonstrates the main tenet of propaganda theory, which is the best propaganda is that which tells you the truth, but just tells you part of the truth that persuades you to act in a particular way. Third, branding. I think the whole story of Al Jazeera indicates the importance of clarity and cohesion in any institution's brand. The discrepancy between Al Jazeera English and Al Jazeera Arabic Al Jazeera Children, Al Jazeera Sports. No one knows how they're connected, how the funding goes between the different parts of the organization. Have severely hurt Al Jazeera's ability to become a truly global brand like it was under the reigns of Al Jazeera Arabic. When there was just Al Jazeera Arabic, we knew what that was. Everyone knew what that was. Now when you talk about Al Jazeera, there's less recognition of what it actually means. And that demonstrates the importance of clarity and cohesion in any organization's brand. Clash of civilizations, uh, the story about how Al Jazeera English and Al Jazeera Arabic struggled to cooperate and collaborate for me is evidence of Samuel Huntington's thesis that there is some inherent tensions between different civilizations in the world. I disagree with the majority of the theory of class civilizations. But the fact that well-trained, intelligent news journalists couldn't find a way to tell the same story to Arab and English speaking audiences when it came to Middle East politics indicates there really is something about these civilizations that's diff difficult to reconcile. Now again, I don't agree with most of the theory, but I think that this story indicates there is, there's more to it than what a lot of people think. Two more quick theories I want to touch on. One, uh, one is network journalism. This is a very hot and interesting theory about the future of journalism. 
utilizing citizen resources and opinions, integrating them into the journalistic story. It's cheaper for news organizations because they become de facto journalists. It's more compelling news because audience members are involved in the storytelling process. Everyone's very excited about it. The story of Al Jazeera indicates there are serious risks, serious risks that need to be considered. Al Jazeera has a robust vetting process for social media stories. They, they try to verify anything they get on Facebook or Twitter. And the stories that came from Syria passed that robust framework, that typology, to verify those stories, even though it turns out later on they were fabricated propaganda fed to them. And the risks involved in broadcasting citizen news clips that turn out to be false are significant. And I think the impact they've had on the overall structure and brand of Al Jazeera indicates just how important it is to be careful as organizations transition to become more networked journalism organizations. And finally, I'll mention media effects, and specifically media system dependency theory. And we're still stuck in a world where we try to measure the impact of media on ratings. Right? Advertisers base their decisions on ratings. Uh, CEOs base their decisions on ratings. And ratings usually indicate one simple thing. Did you watch this show? at this particular time. Um, sometimes I'll ask you, did you watch it once a week? Sometimes I'll ask you if you watched it once a day. But it's really a question of, did you physically have your eyes open while this show or this channel was broadcasting its content? And that doesn't mean anything anymore. That doesn't mean anything anymore. We watch all sorts of things. We engage all sorts of media content on a daily basis. I predict that people will continue to watch Al Jazeera like they've watched it in the past. Maybe not the same uh, amount of news or the same number of, of uh, viewers will be exactly the same, but it certainly will remain popular. I do predict, however, that the credibility assigned to Al Jazeera will be significantly less, and thus its ability to shape Arab public opinion will no longer be what it has been since 1996. Media system dependency theory gives you a rubric for how you want to measure the impact of media. Rather than bore you with the details of that, though, I'll just recommend you read Sandra Balrokish's article on it. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions.